Hello grade 11s. Today we're going to start with a couple demonstrations that are going to help illustrate uh, the gas law we are learning about today. Now the first one I have for you is a marshmallow trapped within a syringe. Now when I pull on the syringe, increasing its volume, you can see that the marshmallow grows in size. When I depress it back to its normal volume, it shrinks. So let's see that again. It grows and it shrinks. Why does that happen? Another demonstration for you. Here, we have a dropper that is inside of this two liter pop bottle and it is floating. Now watch what happens when I squeeze the pop bottle. Huh, falls to the bottom. Very interesting. And if we take a really close look here, watch what happens when I squeeze the bottle. Look at that air pocket. Huh, look at that. So, the air pocket is decreasing in size. Now, what could cause that? Think about it. Okay. So the gas law that we're going to be exploring today is the relationship between pressure and volume. This is also known as Boyle's law. Now, how did Boyle determine this relationship? Well, he created an experiment in which he had a series of J tubes. And what he ended up doing was trapping some gas in there with mercury. Now, what he ended up doing was he added mercury and added more and added more and added more and he saw what impact that would have on the volume of gas and what he found was that as he increased the amount of mercury the volume of that gas decreased and decreased and decreased now why is this well this is because the weight of mercury was going up so the pressure as a result experienced on this gas went up as well. Now, back in the day, they didn't invent graphing yet. Um, so they plotted out all of this data in a you know, table of values. Uh, they analyzed it and they said, okay, well, these things are inverse, right? Pressure and volume are inverse. What does that mean? Well, as pressure goes up, what do you think happens to your volume? These are inversely proportional, right? As pressure goes up, volume will go down. That's what he found. Now, if volume goes up, what do you think happens to your pressure? Well, they're inversely proportional. So if volume goes up, that means that your pressure must have went down. Now, obviously, we invented graphing for a reason. It's way easier to explore these relationships if you graph it out. Now, if you look at the graphs here of uh, pressure versus volume, this first graph here is simply just pressure versus volume. Now, as we increase our pressure, we find that our volume gets smaller and smaller and smaller. When we continue properties of matter, you'll realize that once the particles get close enough together, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think it's going to stay as a gas? No, right? It's going to turn into a liquid and then eventually a solid. Um, if you plot out the relationship of pressure to 1 over volume, you find that you get a straight line. Well, what does that mean? That means that they are inversely proportional uh, completely. So, what do you think would happen if I double the pressure? Is it going to double the volume? Is it going to half the volume? No, it's going to half the volume, right? What happens if we triple the pressure? Well, your volume is now going to be one third of what it was. Um, what happens if we cut the pressure by a factor of four, right? Our pressure is now one fourth what it was. What happens to our volume? Our volume is now four times greater as a result, right? So they are inversely proportional to one another. 
Now, I mentioned this already, but Boyle at the time did recognize the limitations of this experiment. Um, and he realized that if you continue to apply more pressure, adding more and more and more mercury, eventually that air would just become a liquid. Right? So he realized that there was a limit to how much you could compress this gas. Now, what are some practical applications of Boyle's law? Well, one of them is hot air balloons. In particular, let's explore weather balloons. Now, for those of you that have uh, you know, been a part of the High Altitude Balloon, cl uh, balloon Club here at FRC, uh, or you know what we do, we take a balloon, a, uh, a latex balloon, a weather balloon, we fill it up with helium, um, and once it gets to a high enough altitude, it blows up. That's what it's designed to do. And then our payload falls back to the Earth. Why is it, though, that the balloon explodes? How does it explode? Well, think about it. We established last lesson that as you go higher up in the atmosphere, there's less atmospheric pressure, right? If you have a barometer, the higher you climb a mountain, the less mercury it will show, right? The mercury height will decrease. So if there's less pressure experienced on our balloon, the higher it goes, the volume of the balloon is going to increase and increase and increase and increase until it gets to a point where the material will literally fail and it explodes, right? And then the payload falls back to Earth. So that's one practical application um, of Boyle's Law. What's another one? Well, for those of you that have taken biology with me, another practical application is looking at breathing. So when we breathe, um, our lungs effectively are just at the whim of the pressure changes that happen in our chest cavity. So when we breathe in, our diaphragm moves down, our ribs and intercostal muscles, uh, intercostal muscles move up and out, and as a result, the volume of our chest cavity increases. If we increase volume, well, what's going to happen to pressure? Right? It's going to go down. So there's now decreased pressure in our chest cavity, um, and as a result, pressure likes to go from high to low, aka from the external environment into our lungs. Right? So we'll draw air into our lungs as a result. Our lungs will expand to try to equalize that pressure. Right? They will, uh, the lungs will expand, decreasing the volume of your chest cavity to try to equalize the pressure with your external environment. Now, when you breathe out, your intercostal muscles and your diaphragm, they all relax. Your, your ribs come in and down. Your diaphragm moves up. And as a result, the volume of your chest cavity goes down. So what's going to happen to the pressure? Well, the pressure is going to go up. Now your pressure is higher than the external pressure. And as a result, pressure goes high to low. It's going to move air out of your lungs. Your lungs will shrink, increasing the volume within your chest cavity, equalizing the pressure with your external environment. So breathing is another great example of Boyle's Law at work. Another one is syringes or straws. Now, some of you, last lesson, may have been a little confused. You know, what was it that was holding up uh, that liquid? Why was it hold, held up to 32 feet? Well, at 32 feet, um, the weight of water is equal to the weight of the atmosphere, right? They are equal and opposite. And if we put more water in than 32 feet, we put in 34 feet of water in our tube, well, it's just going to drain to 32 feet because at 32 feet, that's where the weight of the water is equal to the weight of our atmosphere, right? With mercury, it's at 760 millimeters. So 760 millimeters of mercury, that's where the weight of the mercury is equal to the weight of our atmosphere. So what pushes that water and holds it at 32 feet? Well, that's the weight of the atmosphere. Now, if you look at a straw, right, when we breathe in, we're increasing the volume of our chest cavity, decreasing pressure. And as a result, we're going to decrease the pressure above the liquid in our straw. Now, what's pushing down on that liquid? Well, it's atmospheric pressure. Pressure goes from high to low. 
right? You, as a result, liquid goes into your mouth. Now, if we look at a syringe, syringes work in a similar fashion. When I pulled the syringe down, the volume of the syringe increased. So what happened to the pressure? Well, the pressure went down. Now, as I pushed the syringe back up, decreasing the volume, what happened to the pressure? The pressure increased. Okay, so now let's explore an example problem um, that will kind of give you the basis for how you're going to be solving gas law problems from now on. So the problem reads, if three liters of a gas uh, is initially at a pressure of one atmosphere, what would be the new pressure to cause the volume of a gas to become 0.5? liters. Now, I'm going to show you a strategy that I will, I, will, I want you to use. Uh, there is a formula for all of these different gas laws, but a lot of you had trouble working with ratios in stoic, and this is going to be a great opportunity to practice ratio thinking, to practice those skills such that you have the number sense that when you get stoic on your final exam, uh, you're going to ace it. So what I would recommend you do is step one, you are going to predict. Now, what do I mean by predict here? Well, what was the relationship that we found between pressure and volume? They were inversely proportional, right? For a change in our volume, we see an inverse change in our pressure and vice versa, right? If we double our volume, we have our pressure. So let's write down what we have here first. We have an initial volume of three liters. We have a final volume of 0.5 liters. We have an initial pressure of one atmosphere. And we're looking for our final pressure. Now, what did we do? Well, we decreased our volume. We decreased our volume. How much did we decrease our volume by? For those keen observers out there, we decreased it six times. If we decrease our volume six times, what must have happened to our pressure? Well, our pressure must have increased six times. So what is our prediction? Our prediction, our Volume decreased, therefore our pressure must have increased. Now, you're not always going to get numbers that work out this way where you're going to be able to solve it intuitively, right? You're not going to be able to look and be like, look, our volume decreased by six or our pressure increased by six. The answer is six atmospheres. You're not going to get problems like that. So let's figure out what do we do if we don't get nice numbers? Well, step two, we are going to multiply by the ratio of our volume. Now, why would I multiply here by the ratio of our volume? Why? Well, the ratio here of our volume is going to represent how much it increased by or how much it decreased by. Now, we have two options for multiplying by a ratio. We can choose 3 liters over 0 0.5 liters, or we can choose 0 0.5 liters over 3 liters. Now, when determining which of these two ratios you should use, you should keep in mind that what is our goal? What was our prediction? Our prediction is that our pressure should increase. Which of these two is going to increase our pressure? 3 over 0.5 or 0.5 over 3? Well, clearly it's going to be 3 over 0.5. What's 3 divided by 0.5? It's, it's 6, right? This makes perfect sense. So by decreasing our volume by a factor of six, we are going to increase our pressure.
by a factor of 6. So when I do the final math, all we are going to do is multiply by the ratio of our volume. Um, and in this case, we are multiplying the pressure here. I probably should have wrote that word in here. Multiply the pressure by the ratio of our volume. And what is our pressure? Our pressure was one atmosphere. And what ratio do we decide to use? Well, we're going to use 3 over 0.5 because we know our pressure should go up. And as a result, we find that our new pressure is 6 atmospheres. That is our final answer. So make sure that when you are doing these problems, you predict, right? You find out, okay, did my volume go down? Did my volume go up? And as a result, what happened to my pressure? You know, did my pressure go up? Did my pressure go down? And as a result, what happens to my volume? And then lastly, you need to multiply by the ratio of your volumes or the ratio of your pressures um, in a way that fits your prediction. Okay, I really recommend you get used to solving by this method. Uh, it's going to help you a ton with number sense and thinking fractionally. Okay, so now let's explore a slightly more challenging problem. Uh, with this problem here, the numbers aren't quite as nice, right? It's hard to tell exactly what change occurred um, as a result in our change in pressure. So our syringe contains 25 milliliters of gas at 100 kilopascals. The pressure in the syringe is changed to 15 kilopascals. What is the new volume of the gas? So what is step one? Step one is we need to predict. So what do we have? Well, we know that our pressure initially was 100 kilopascals, and our final pressure was 15 kilopascals. We know that our initial volume is 25 milliliters. And what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for, well, what is our new volume? What is the change in our volume as a result of the change in our pressure? So our pressure decreased, right? So what is the prediction? Our pressure went down. Therefore, what will happen to our volume? Our volume, as a result, should increase. Remember, they are inversely proportional. So how are we going to increase our volume? Well, we're going to multiply it by the ratio of our pressures. Now, we have two options, right? We can multiply by 100 over 15, or we can multiply by, right, or we can multiply by 15 over 100. Now, which of these two is going to be the one we multiply by? Well, clearly, we are going to be multiplying by the thing that increases our volume, a.k.a. this one here. Now, if you do the math, um, 100 divided by 15 gives you 6.666 continuing, right? So, this makes sense. Um, we decreased our pressure by 6.666 continuing times. And as a result, we are going to increase our volume by the same amount. So, when I take our volume of 25 milliliters and I multiply it by the ratio of our pressures, so 100 over 15, Um, we get 166.66 continuing um, milliliters as our answer. So a lot of the times you're not going to get uh, nice, easy, you know, relativistic numbers. Like I'm not going to be like saying double the volume, what impact on pressure, triple the volume, what impact on pressure. A lot of the times you're going to get, uh, get you know, a, a 6.666 decrease in pressure. Well, what is a 6.66 times decrease in pressure going to do to our volume? It's going to increase it 
by 6.666 times. So uh, that is how you solve these problems. Okay, so let's answer those questions now. Why did the marshmallow grow when I pull the syringe down? Right? Why does it shrink when I push it back up? Why does that happen? Well, what makes a marshmallow fluffy? It has little pockets of trapped gas, right? What are those pockets? Pressure. Well, it's one atmosphere of pressure. So when we pull the syringe down, right, just like our weather balloon, we are decreasing the pressure in here because we've increased its volume. Therefore, there's less pressure on those little pockets of gas. So what are they going to do? They're going to expand. That's why the marshmallow grows. And in the same vein, if we look at our Cartesian diver here, right, why is it that the volume of gas decreases when I squeeze the bottle? Well, what am I doing? I am decreasing the volume of the container, thus increasing the pressure. When I increase the pressure on that gas, just like Boyle's J tube, by increasing the pressure on that trapped gas, we are going to de decrease its volume. And by decreasing its volume, we are therefore decreasing the buoyant force because now there is more water within our dropper, and that's why it sinks.